it's me again, and today we're going to talk about Corrupt Bargain, the 1824 presidential election from Decisions Games. I did an unboxing on this, and you'll uh, see a link for that in the description of this. But this is an after-action report and a brief discussion of gameplay. This isn't meant to be a, a rules overview. You can't play the game based on what I'm going to talk about here, but... Uh, I thought I'd at least cover the after action. So this is uh, situ this is the in game situation. Blue is John Quincy Adams. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, red is Andrew Jackson. Green is William Crawford, and yellow is Henry Clay. Uh, you can choose what uh, colors you want for each of the different candidates. But if you wanted to follow, you know, in the book, they kind of have a the, the whole back seven to eight pages of this is all history of the of the rules book, and they had uh, red for Adams, green for Jackson, blue for Crawford, and yellow for Clay. But uh, you know, you can do what you want, and they actually say in there you can pick whatever color you want. Um, and this was the final situation here. So what uh, uh, went ten rounds on a four player game? You go ten rounds. And the final electoral college count was 94 for Clay, 77 for Adams, 50 for Crawford, and 40 for uh, Jackson. So Andrew Jackson didn't even get a chance to complain about the corrupt bargain this time around. Um, <clears throat> Crawford really, uh, uh, Crawford and, and Adams kind of got into a, a fight over uh, some of the northern states uh and then that allowed clay to kind of sneak in at the end and get some some positioning in the northern states especially kind of snuck into massachusetts into uh john quincy's adams backyard and took that out uh as well as you know new jersey so um and then played very strong in the west and uh and in the the, the south as well so in New York was a huge win for Clay that kind of put propped him ahead. Uh, Andrew Jackson started out relatively strong, but then um, it was kind of a, uh, you know, chase the leader and, and take take out the leader uh, type situation. And he eventually, uh, you know, fell out of contention with only 40 electoral votes. So the way you work this is you need to have a majority of electoral votes, and the majority at this point uh, in 1824 would be 131 electoral college votes. Uh, nobody achieved that. Clay had 94 and Adams had 77 were the closest. So then you go to a, con um, a uh, contingent election, and so you you, uh, you uh, drop out the third place, or sorry, the fourth place finisher, so Andrew Jackson, did not even get a chance to go another round. And then you just add up the uh, hexes uh, or the political influences. And that, um, uh, the political octagons is what they call them. And then you, and it's just based on states. So you have to win uh, 13 states uh, at that time. And so the contingent election between John Quincy Adams uh, sorry, between Clay, Adams, and Crawford it turned out to be uh, Clay with 10, Qu uh, John Quincy Adams with 9, and Crawford with 5. And you have to have 13 to have a majority, so then nobody won that. So then you drop out the third place candidate and then go to a uh, contingent election again. And basically what a contingent election is representing is you're just seeing who won the states. Uh, and so it's going to... Uh, basically going to the the House of Representatives. Uh, the, that's the way the Electoral College works. You have the Electoral College. If you've got the appropriate number uh, of Electoral College and you elect as president, if you don't, then um, it will go to the you know, to a majority of the states. And that's what so that's where the octagons really come into play uh, there. Uh, so then the second contingent election, just just kind of a runoff between Clay and Adams left Clay with 15 and Adams with 9, which um, elected uh, Clay as the uh, president in the 1824 election, which uh, 
you know, in, in, in real time or in reality, Clay fell out, uh, had the least amount of votes uh, of the 1824 election in the Electoral College. So um, there you have it. That's what happened. So, you know, dreams can come true. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the gameplay here and, and kind of explain how we got to this situation. So uh, on the on your turn, uh, well, let's talk one thing. I uh, say that I set up the historical variant. Uh, otherwise, this is relatively a, 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 a equal game. That's not asymmetrical at all. Everybody is balanced. Everybody has the same options. Uh, so there's no uh, there's no uh, advantage or a special player power, candidate power, if you play the regular game. However, if you use the historical setup option, then you're going to seed some of these states based on what their, uh, what their starting um, power is. You know, so like Adams will have some uh, support in the North and uh, uh, Jackson will have support in Tennessee and some parts of the South and Crawford and uh, uh, Clay have their uh, local support or where, where they start out with some of their support. If you don't play with that option, then you just start on turn one and it's everybody's equal. Everybody, everybody has equal uh, footing. Uh, if you do the historical option, then you nest it based on what, or seed it based on what's in the rules. And then you start with game turn two. So you're basically, it's basically saying, Hey, the first turn was to get them to their, to their base setting. Um, so that's interesting. And again, that 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 kind of uh, bodes more uh, or, or puts this game more along the lines of a game than a simulation. You have that historical setup, but that's it. I mean, the the each of the different candidates don't have any special abilities during the game, uh, especially if you don't do the historical setup. You know, there's these these uh, events which are the key to the game, but there are these suits they call them. There's three different suits that you need to try to collect to do lockouts, and we'll talk about that. But none of the candidates have a uh, uh, preference for those or, or have an advantage on based on what one of those uh, agendas are. One is, uh, you know, there's slavery. There is Western expansion, which is the, um, you know, uh, covered wagon. And then there is trade. I don't have any around here. Trade is a ship. I don't have any sticking out there right there. Here, here, there's a trade right there. So those are your three different suits that you want to collect to do lockouts, and I'll explain that. Um, but uh, there's no asymm uh, asymmetrical player powers in here. You can do the historical setup and give you somewhat of a f feel or flavor for the historical setup, but once you get into the game, it's it's all equal, uh, and that and from a game standpoint, that's good because then uh, no one person is going to have a s special advantage, and you don't have to work about work worry about balancing type effects. However, you know it, it becomes a true game as opposed to simulation. So I was a little leery of that going in, but I have to say, uh, spoiler alert to some of my thoughts, uh, I, I was pleasantly surprised. This played very nicely, very cleanly. Um, did not overstay its welcome. It played relatively fast. And uh, once you get to the rules and the rules are not, you know, that long or that complex, uh, you can play this relatively quickly, uh, even a, a four-player game. Uh, of course, a four-player game has, only has 10 turns. A two-player game has uh, 16 turns. So that might play a little bit longer uh, with the, the shorter player count. But um, so uh, on your turn... You basically have, uh, you're going to pick one of these cards over here, one of these event cards, uh, and they have a corresponding slot of how many action points you have. So if you pick the card in this slot, you're going to have zero action points, so you're just going to do whatever's on the card. If you pick this one, you're going to be able to get three action points. You get the, you read, you follow the event, and you get three action points, and you keep the uh, event in your hand. The rules are not especially clear on that, but... That's the only way that makes sense. But you take the event and keep that in your hand because you're trying to collect these uh, these symbols here, these suits, one of the three different suits. Um, so which, which kind of begs the question, why would you ever take a zero action point or a one action point when you have a three action point out there? Well, it depends on the event because 
later in the game, uh, some of these uh, three action, the, the, the cards that find their way to the three action point, the event's not that great, uh, especially if you have lockouts. And again, I'll, I'll get to lockouts. They're very important. Um, they're not as effective uh, later in the game or at certain points of the game, or they might not be part of your strategy. Uh, but for the most part, most people, they go for the three action point because it gives you the most variety. Uh, this other two action point and one insight. Well, what is one insight? Well, uh, with that, you get two action points and then you get to do one insight, which is you get to uh, draw from an opponent's hand uh, two cards. Then they, what they're going to have in their hand, they're going to have uh, politician and populist cards. And you get to draw two of those randomly from their hand, and you, you're able to keep one of those or kind of steal it, and then the other one goes back to them. And if they don't have any cards, then you're just going to draw from the deck, or they don't have enough cards, then you'll draw the, 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 the second card from one of the decks of politician or populist. Uh, what are these cards? Uh, these cards are basically part of the end game. So right before you do um, the final electoral count, you're going to play, there's going to be a round of every, all the players playing these cards and then doing one last ditch effort. They call it the final push to try to affect the board state, you know, by either adding a cube or adding, uh, you know, the, the populace adds cubes and the... Um, the politician cards adds the political hexagons. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what those political, uh, what those mean. The, the cubes mean population. So on, on states on the board that have a square, well, they, they, it's all going to be about who has the most cubes, who has the most of these square cubes in that state is going to win that state at the end of the game. Uh, states that have uh, capital little icons there, well, then it's all about the hexagons. And so you, whoever has the most hexagons is going to win that state. Now, the number is the number of electoral college votes. So you're trying to get up to, again, 132, you automatically win the game at the end. So you're trying to, you know, you're either you doing population with cubes or you're doing uh, adding hexagons uh, to, to try to take out the capital. And again, the hexagons had that added effect of if there's no clear electoral college winner, then the hexagons are going to come into play because that's going to see who controls the state. Uh, they also factor heavily in tiebreakers, and I'll talk about that in a second. So, so the the goal of the game, again, is to win the presidency. You have to get 131 electoral college votes. The way you get that is by winning these states. The way you win these states is some states have population that you want to win. Some states you want to have uh, hexagons uh, to have political control to win the game. Um, so those those uh, politician and populist cards come in effect at the end of the game after everybody all all the rounds whatever if it's a four player game 10, 10 rounds have been played and then you'll uh go through a round of playing populist or pop, pol politician cards and then after that then you'll start awarding you know the 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 state cards and see who has the most electoral college votes so on your turn you're going to do you're going to do, you can do the you're going to pick an event you're going to do whatever it says on the event sometimes these add cubes sometimes these add hexes sometimes these allow you to uh, draw population or po uh, politician cards sometimes they remove cubes uh, or uh, hexes or sometimes they let you to, you know re remove uh, one of your rivals stuff so they they do various things uh, as i said the most optimal usually is the three action points but sometimes there's something down here, like you know, you, you're you're trying to c collect that one symbol there, and so you might take a, a less optimal uh, action or insight choice. But it the event works better for you. So let's talk about the actions. The actions you get to do on your turn is you can for one action you can uh, place a, a, a political uh, octagon in one state. So you can place one of your uh, octagons. I was calling them hexagons earlier. Uh, you can place a cube. So you can place uh, one of your popular votes. You can uh, b draw a politician card or you can draw a populist card or you can do political intrigue. Political intrigue is where you remove one of your octagons and you can remove two of a rival's octagons. So you're going to lose some of your support, but you're taking out 
someone else's support in an area. That becomes very important in, in these capital areas where you see uh, the capitals, and they also come important in tiebreakers. We'll talk about that. And then the insight, we talked about that, uh, what happens when you get the insight. Uh, that's not an action. That, that You can only use the insight on these if you pick an event from these two areas there. And uh, however, no specific action can be conducted more than once in a player turn. So you can only do one of those in a player turn. Um, so that's your action. So if you get these actions based on this, uh, depending on which event you take, you get to play whatever's on the event cards. And then you collect these cards for their symbols. And why you want to collect these? Well, if you get three of these, so if I get three covered wagons, I can turn, uh, which is Westward Expansion, I can turn those in and then place a uh, a lockout or a lockdown. I think it's is it lockout or lockdown. Anyway, I place one of these black uh, uh, cylinders on the board, and that means nothing can be taken, put in or removed from that state. So, for example, Andrew Jackson uh, placed this, uh, turned in three cards, turned in three of the same suit, and then um, placed this lockout here because he was at four to three, and that uh, – that means that that Tennessee's locked down now, meaning that nobody can put anything in there, nobody can take anything out of there. He's guaranteed to win that at the end of the game. And so wherever you see these black uh, cylinders, that's what someone did, when a player did or a candidate did to lock down that state to assure that they've got it now. There's no more cubes going in or out of that state. Um, and so that that's a key notion because number one, uh, it guarantees you that state, and and nobody can and you and you know and these these are locked in. You're limited to whatever many cubes you have, uh, so that person can't get those out of there if they want to move it to somewhere else or you know use it for some uh, later turn. That's locked down. Uh, the, the another key notion is that's locked down for in game purposes. So uh, that's something I found out in the first time I played this game, is that really kind of hampers these uh, politician and populist cards because a lot of times you'll have something, oh, I can add uh, I can add plus one to Illinois. Uh, Illinois is not locked down, so that's fine. But if it was locked down, uh, I can't do anything with that now. I mean, that card is useless because I can't add or remove, uh, even though I have something to add or remove at the end of the game. So uh, Collecting these cards looks at the beginning of the game looks. Oh, this is interesting. I, I want to be able to do all these plus ones and and kind of trump people at the end of the game. However, um, you're not going to be able to do if some if, if it's locked down. Then it basically becomes null and void at that point. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind as well. So let's talk about the tiebreaker because that is very key in this game because uh, that comes out that comes up a lot because this is a very tight game. I, I don't. Uh, uh, I don't know how how you, you could get to 131 in this game. Maybe if you're playing the two-player game, maybe, but uh, I don't know how you get to 131 in this game uh, The um, to get an automatic victory because it, it's just so tight. So breaking ties. So the first thing to break a tie, so whenever there's a tie, like if there's a tie in in the cubes, which is population, or tie in octagons, which is you know your political influence, Whenever you're trying to break a tie, uh, especially to see who won the state, uh, you're going to um, you know, have the most political octagons in that state, okay? Well, if you got a tie in octagons like Louisiana here, well, then you know, you got to go to the next one. So the next one is if still tied by having the most political octagons in the state's region. So then you add up all the octagons in the west, so this is the region of Louisiana, and in this case, K, uh, Clay won. So Clay took Louisiana from Andrew Jackson because he had ended up having more uh, octagons in the West region. So octagons become very important. They become important to take over these capital states or these uh, these legislative vote states, but they're also important for tiebreakers down the road. So you want to have enough octagons in the regions so that you can win ties for that. Uh, if it's still tied, then it's the most political octagons on the entire map. So again, the value of octagons are very important. If uh, if you don't, if if you're still tied in the region, then it's if you have some octagons somewhere else on the map and still have have, have the majority, then you're going to win that tie. If it's still tied after that, then there's the ultimate tiebreaker, which is basically it becomes a random thing. You you draw an event card, 
and then whoever has the higher number of the event card uh, wins because all you know, the event cards are numbered. Uh, wins the wins the thing. So you know, uh, <laughs> kind of a coin flip at that point. So uh, so octagons really have a. Um, because sometimes you're thinking, well, why do I have octagons in states that require, um, you know, population votes? You know, why would I want to have that in there? Well, you're going to have that in there because it helps tiebreakers in that region. It helps tiebreakers across the board if you have to keep going down to those second or third layer of tiebreakers. Um, and that all is the game, pretty much. Again, don't use this as a as a rules summary, but that's basically how the game plays. You're going to, everybody's going to take... Uh, their turn, um, you know, picking one of these cards, playing the event, pl you know, using their action points or insight as, as the case may be. Then it goes to the next person. Then once all four, if you're playing a four player game, once all four candidates have done their turn, it goes to the next turn and whoever is, whoever is second, you know, they put their token on that turn and then they go first. And so it just keeps rotating. So everybody gets to go first. Uh, at least uh, at least once, usually a couple of times or more in the game. Um, and then uh, you'll play to the certain number of rounds. In a four-player game, it's 10. In a three-player game, it's 13. And in a two-player game, it's 16. Then you'll uh, do your final push, which is you know playing these politician and populist cards uh, to the extent that you can if they're in the, the state's not locked out. And then... Um, Add up the, then you start awarding these cards, the electrical uh, vote, count vote cards. And if you got 131, you win. If you don't, then you go to a contingent election, which is um, who who won the most states based on the octagons in that state. Again, another importance of the octagons. And then um, if you don't win that, then that the the next the third place person falls out, and then it, you go down to who wins the states on the, on a two player count or the two candidate count uh overall uh i, I like this game i thought i think it, it does a nice job of giving you some feel for this election and some of the issues of this election and how some of the uh regions were kind of outlined and the uh, how elect electoral college was divvied up at that point um so i like that the cards have some history on them so you can read up on that uh, and, the, and these events, you have a huge deck of these events, so this game's going to play different every time. You have these even larger decks of po politician and populist, which you you don't really get into much of these. Um, I think if you play heavy on that and then have a lot of lockouts, then that really kind of takes away the, the value of these cards. Uh, we had quite a few lockouts here, but if you don't have a lot of lockouts, then, uh, then these cards are going to be more valuable because you'll be able to do more in some of the states. Um, the, uh, the components are nice. I mean, it's cubes. you got octagons, you've got cubes, you've got uh, black cylinders. The b board is mount, uh, mounted. The cards are fine. Uh, they're a little thin, but they're still sturdy, uh, and very usable. This is not a deck builder or shuffler game, so you're not going to have a ton of wear or tear on these over time. They, um, you know, you just have to shuffle them at the beginning to sort them out. So overall, uh, I like it. Uh, the, the only thing that uh, kind of my – a little bit of my criticism on it is this whole uh, – it, it, it's the, the fact that it's all symmetrical, the fact that everybody's pretty equal. I mean you have that historical setup, which, which we played with. However, um, that's not a lot. I mean that's just a, a, a flavor. It's just kind of a starting position, which I guess is fine. At least it's something, right? But, um, you know, it just feels like there'd be, you know, some kind of preference for the issues or, um, you know, for, for the candidates being tied to a certain issue or have some kind of asymmetrical power to maybe further bolster a region or a state. I don't know. I mean, it, it, it would, the game would play different and it would be you'd have a lot of potential balance issues and have to figure out how that would work out to um to to balance that out so i can understand why they didn't go that direction so this as, as for a game if you want to play a political game this is really good and 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 very uh to my, my everybody enjoyed it let's put it that way 
uh, if you want to play a simulation, you might not get as much out of this as, as a pure simulation. Let's, let's put it that way for there. But that's what I have for you today, talking a little bit about uh, Corrupt Bargain from Decision Games. Um, you know, I've, I've, in my video on the unboxing, I have some links to other videos where I talk about political games and my interest in political games. So, um, check that out. Cause I, I do, I do like elected uh, election games and political games. And, uh, I found this interesting. This is, this is pretty cool. And plus I like to learning a, a part about the history and each of these cards have, you know, some history on it. Plus there's like seven to eight pages of history in the uh, rule book that talks about this certain circum situation. So anyway, that's what I have for you today. If you have any comments or thoughts or likes or dislikes, feel free to put them in the comment section. Love to start a dialogue and see what you have to say. Other than that, thanks for stopping by. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks for any amount of time you spend with me. Uh, it, is, it is appreciated. Just know that. And uh, here's to you having a great rest of the day. Bye. <laughs>